Good evening, everyone. I think this thing is live. Uh, my name is Ken Wyatt from the great Williams College class of 1984, coming to you all live from Amsterdam Lounge in Boise, Idaho. And behind me is James, who's going to be kind of assisting as we talk about cocktails in American history and American culture. But before we get started, I just want to shout out just real quick to all the 84 folks that I see here as co-president of the class. I am definitely excited to see a lot of 84 represented. So best class of the college, but I guess everyone says their class is great. But anyway, 84 representing, thank you very much. Um, also, I just wanna shout out, I think she'll be watching this in playback mode is just shout out to my daughter, Caroline class of 18 who's in California. So she said, dad, it may be too early for me to get on this thing. Um, but here we are and basically just want to start by saying once again, thanks for uh, joining and coming on to talk about cocktails. If I seem a little ragged, it's because I may have procrastinated a little bit. And over the years at Williams, I was not much of a procrastinator. But uh, lately in COVID world, um, you know, there's so many things that we're all trying to juggle at the same time. But thanks to the folks in the alumni office, um, the road heard on me and guided me through the process. Here we are tonight. So thanks. Um, what I want to do is just start by talking about the cocktails that we've got uh, on tap for tonight. And I'll start with the old fashioned, which is one of my favorite cocktails. It's one that I'll often start a meal out if I head out for dinner to a restaurant. It's really kind of my, I'll call it my one and done because usually after that I move into vino, but it's one of my favorite cocktails just because it's, it is refreshing. Um, it does get the palate stimulated and it is a classic. Now, it, it's a cocktail that has deep roots in American history and Technically, it should always be made with rye because rye whiskey was the original whiskey of the colonial and post-colonial period. So in, I believe it was 1791 through 1793, there was the Whiskey Rebellion in the United States. Uh, and I'm not talking about this because of recent rebellions, but essentially the Whiskey Rebellion was the first significant challenge to the central government of the United States and both Alexander Hamilton and George Washington were involved in kind of quieting this um, insurrection, which was about taxes on whiskey to pay for the American Revolution. So this cocktail has definitely deep roots in American culture, but like everything, right, that we see throughout history, it definitely has some popular culture um, uh, ties as well. So some of you younger folks here tonight probably have watched Mad Men. And if you've watched Mad Men about advertising folks in New York City, like Val DeFebo was on the call tonight, on the Zoom tonight. Um, I don't think she's drinking too many of these old fashions, but the main character, Don Draper, was a huge old fashioned fan. So if you watch Mad Men, You've definitely seen Don Draper drink and you've certainly seen him drink the old fashioned. So I'm gonna turn it over to James, who's just gonna talk a little bit about what he's doing behind the bar. Hey everybody, how's it going? So today, of course, like Ken said, we are starting off with a rye old fashioned. The choice that we're using today is we're gonna start off with a couple different bitters, the Angus Thor, the classic bitters that everyone likes to use in any type of old fashioned, as well as we're gonna throw in a little bit of orange bitters too to help complement the orange peel at the end of the cocktail. So of course we start off with both of those two dashes of each and then a half an ounce of your typical simple syrup and then two ounces of your rye of choice. Today we are gonna to use a little bit of oil because we've got handy. And then of course we wanna put it in a nice little small rocks glass. And it is a classic drink that we do wanna use a couple big rocks with. That, sorry to interrupt, that is the key to an old fashioned. Do not use crushed ice. No, no, definitely don't use crushed ice. And then of course we wanna put it in a mixer glass. We're using a pint glass today with some ice in it just to help chill down the cocktail. The importance of this is you want to stir it rather than shake it. It doesn't dilute the cocktail and it actually helps keep the smoothness of the traditional liquor heavy cocktail, such as old fashioned. So after that, we're going to strain it right over into our rocks glass with a couple big ice cubes in there. 
and then almost complete, we are going to garnish it today with a couple of Stardo cherries. They are a little bit nicer to use than your typical cherry that you can get anywhere else. And then just a slight little bit of the cherry juice that goes in it just helps kind of sweeten it up just a tad. And then one of the most important things that I find as a bartender here making Old Fashioned is going to be the orange peel with it. Of course, you want to express the orange a little bit. You don't want to cut too deep and expose the fruit itself on the underneath. But by expressing it just slightly a little bit, what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this guy and we're going to flame it into the glass. So as we do that, we want to be sure to just get the orange side of it just a little bit kind of hot. We don't want to do the inside of it too. And then we grab it carefully with both fingers on one side. We don't want to squeeze it. That's actually going to release oils too soon. So as we just heat it up just a little bit, we want to do this directly over into the glass, flame it just a little bit, give it a nice little stir. I find when you flame the orange directly into the glass, it helps complement the orange bitters from the beginning. And it adds a little bit of an aroma as you drink more with your nose and your eyes rather than your taste at first. That today is our old fashioned. Kids, do not try the flaming at home. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Delicious. Thank you. Perfect. And as I mentioned, the key is having at least one big cube or two decent sized cubes, because if you um, apply crushed ice, those of you who studied chemistry know that it will dilute the drink faster because there's more surface area um, hitting the ice cube. So one ice cube melts more slowly because of that. And I'm sure Ken Taylor, Dr. Taylor, who's on with us tonight, could explain that in a subsequent chat. Okay, so, oh, one other thing about the old fashioned. Um, you do not need to use your most expensive whiskey for this um, because you are adding these extra ingredients, you know, the sugar and, and the fruit. So um, you can go for a relatively inexpensive uh, rye whiskey. I suggest the Rittenhouse rye, uh, although we use the bullet tonight. Do you recall what the Rittenhouse goes for per bottle? The, the Rittenhouse is it's on the same level. I think it might be a little bit under the bullet itself. Rittenhouse, though, like Ken was saying, is a fantastic choice to use for my whiskey in old fashioned because you don't want to take something a little bit nicer, such as you know, whistle pig or a Thomas Handy uh, type of rye. That you want to enjoy a little bit more straight. But when you're mixing it in a classic cocktail, such as this old fashioned, Rittenhouse is a perfect one to use. I got a little direction, James, from our uh, people in the studio tonight. They said just talk a little more slowly. Okay. okay. So anyway, moving on to the next cocktail. And when you think about cocktails, I think one of the first things that pops up is the martini glass. It is kind of the icon for what a cocktail represents. And obviously that glass represents luxury, but it brings up a lot of other things uh, in terms of American culture. So you think of prohibition. You think of flappers, the, the roaring 20s, and of course, the one and only James Bond, who took the original martini and put a spin on it. And that spin is that he used vodka in his martini. And that's what we're basically going to do tonight. But I did send out, you know, just some things that I've read over the years about cocktails. And this is basically a little bit of reading about how the martini fueled the great literary circles, um, including the ones in New York that, um, you know, have been portrayed in movies. I think, I'm trying to think of the actress, um, but who basically portrayed, um, you know, that particular literary circle, the Algonquin round table. So you, you definitely have the martini uh, figuring itself a big place. And for me, um, there's always the saying about martinis, well, one is not enough and maybe three is too much. Um, that's, if I'm, if I'm campaigning a little longer, I might go for two on the, on the martini. And myself personally, um, and this is debatable, uh, but some people like the uh, taste of vermouth. I like a touch in my uh, martinis. Some people say it's totally gross and, and you know, not very tasty, but I feel it does add a little more depth um, to the cocktail. And a variation on the 
vodka martini that I like is something that's known as a Gibson, which is basically the same as the vodka martini, but it substitutes cocktail onions instead of the, um, the olives. And of course, you can see people stuffing olives and adding all kinds of things like blue cheese to that. But as a purist, uh, for me, it's if I'm going with the olives, it's just the plain olives. So I'm gonna turn it back over to James is gonna make a vodka martini featuring our 44 North Idaho potato vodka. Over to James. Of course, like you said, we are gonna start off with some potato vodka. But before we go into actually building the cocktail, one of the most important things you're gonna to wanna to do, or have somebody before you that are gonna make it, is actually chilling the glass. So we start off by just filling it up with ice and then putting a little bit of water in it. That's just gonna help chill the glass, keep it nice and cool and refreshing for you as you are sipping on it once we're finished. And just like the old fashioned, we are gonna mix this guy because it is a liquor heavy cocktail in a nice little pint glass here. So we're gonna start off with three ounces of our 44th potato vodka. And then after that, we're gonna follow it up with just a little bit of our dry vermouth. And of course it is, a uh, a vodka martini, so we're just going to use a little bit less of vermouth than I would normally use for a gin cocktail. We're going to do just about a half an ounce of this guy in here. And like Ken was saying too, people have different preferences when it comes to martinis with the taste of vermouth. Some people you can rinse the glass with it, whereas you would just put a little bit of vermouth at the bottom of the glass, swirl it around just a little bit, just to get a little subtle taste of vermouth, but not too overpowering. Just all depends on your preference. So of course, we're gonna empty this out of this little chill. And then similar with the old fashioned, we are gonna stir this guy. Traditionally, we do wanna keep it nice and chill because it doesn't have any ice in it also when it goes into the actual finished glass. So we wanna stir it enough just to get the glass a little bit chill. Pairing that with a chilled cocktail is going to make it nice and refreshing for you when you actually go to drink it. All right, now that we got that going on, we'll go ahead and pour this right into our cocktail glass. And as Ken had previously stated with our um, garnish of the day, um, cocktail onions, are a good choice as well. Today I'm going to use three olives. The reason that I choose to use the three is traditionally when you do want to drink a martini, with the first sip, typically you take one olive off and eat that with that first sip of the cocktail. And then the last olive, you actually will finish the drink, eat the last olive. That's kind of a traditional sense of how you can actually drink your martini. So of course, super simple, super fun to make, very versatile. That is our martini with potato vodka. And one of the things I love about the martini is the vodka martini in particular, is that is, I think it's one of the best cocktails for food. And a lot of cocktails aren't food friendly, but in particular, to me, there's nothing better than a vodka martini with, with steak because the, the vodka and just the, 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 the feel of that really cuts through um, the fat and the salt, and it's just really a refreshing cocktail to have with food. Um, like I said, in, in general, I don't drink a lot of uh, cocktails with eating. It's, cocktails are usually my aperitif um, to start the evening, but a vodka martini is definitely sessionable um, with a, a piece of meat. The other cocktail that I will have with food is the 44 North Huckleberry Lemonade, which goes great with barbecue because that really just cuts through the tanginess and the sourness um, of the barbecue uh, sauce. So, you know, cocktails in general, um, I'm not one to, to, to do a lot of food pairings in, in general. Having actually worked in the wine business, I, I tend to go to wine for food, but there are a few cocktails that, that do pair uh, very, very well. And I was stumped a little earlier uh, on the film about Dorothy Parker in the Vicious Circle, but it was Jennifer Jason Leigh who played that role. And I almost said Sarah Jessica Parker because Sarah Jessica Parker figures into the next cocktail that we're gonna talk about, 
which is the Cosmopolitan. And the Cosmopolitan actually is a cocktail that has a lot of um, personal significance to me because, um, you know, basically being at Williams, well, hey, we all drank beer unlike the sophisticated youngsters of today at Williams who I see drinking all kinds of fantastic stuff that we couldn't afford. Um, so it wasn't until I got working and, you know, living in New York and visited a place on Lafayette Street that I see Val's face on my screen, but she may know it's called Temple Bar. And I believe it closed recently, but it was a really kind of elegant place that you would imagine seeing in the 1920s. And the first time I went in there, I said, what the heck is this place? Because every place else in that neighborhood were, you know, basically kind of just basic bars and gin joints. And that's where I discovered for the first time the Cosmopolitan cocktail and just really for myself, fine cocktails in general. And I guess from, from this reading, I realized that I'm dating myself, but Sex in the City, I believe is 20 years old. So the Cosmopolitan I had was before the show existed, but this show definitely popularized the cocktail. Some people came to um, maybe overpopularize the drink or maybe like breeding you know, dogs that shouldn't be bred, you end up with just a lot of bad permutations of a cocktail. But I do find that a well-made cosmopolitan is a really, really great drink. And I know a lot of guys will say, Ken, that's kind of a drink that's, you know, not, not very macho, but it, it really is, um, if it's well-balanced, it, it's not sweet, uh, it's not too sour, and it's definitely a cocktail that like a good martini, you know, it's somewhat sessionable as well. So for me, the Cosmo is just, like I said, a, a special drink. It's the drink that I believe kind of, you know, certainly came about in a period where, um, you know, I was out in the world earning an income and really enjoying um, cocktails for the first time. And I think if you look at this particular drink, it really did usher in, and places like Temple Bar too, ushered in what I will call like the cocktail resurgence in this country because there was a period, you know, let's just say historically from, and I have theories on it, but, you know, kind of the, the Woodstock generation walked away from the cocktail. And I speculate it was because that generation saw the cocktail as something that Lyndon B. Johnson was drinking in the White House and cocktails were identified with the man, right? So people at that point in the counterculture were looking to get away from the man. So they start looking at other alternatives, uh, you know, certainly beer, wine, um, kind of, I'll call them lesser cocktails, but really the, the, the art of the cocktail and kind of spirits consumption in a way really started to fall off. And spirits consumption really didn't start picking up again in this country, you know, until the late eighties, early nineties. And it was shows like Sex in the City, um, bars like Temple Bar, there was Pegu Club in New York, and there were just a whole bunch of bars that started popping up, you know, from the late 80s to the early 2000s that really kind of brought the cocktail back to where it belongs. And I'm just amazed to see now, you know, people um, consuming Negronis and all kinds of, you know, real classic cocktails, including the old fashioned, which I love. I'm not a big Negroni guy because I'm not a big gin drinker, but. Uh, they certainly have their crowd. So it's, it's really interesting, this particular cocktail, because it plays into, like I said, this resurgence of the cocktail. And also, I think, you know, just the role that women were, were starting to play in our society um, in a way that they'd never played a role before. And being outspoken about their relationships, their careers, their sexuality in ways that had never really been portrayed. So I think the show was groundbreaking from, uh, from a popular cultural perspective, but also it was just kind of embodying what we were experiencing in that time in our lives. Um, you know, and there was a term that defined us back then, we were called yuppies at that point. I haven't heard that term in a long, long time, but that was what we were called in the, in the mid to late eighties. So with that, I'm gonna yeah. turn it over to Mr. James who's gonna make our purple Cosmo, um, which usually uses cranberry juice, but because this is a Williams event, I do have a Williams hat on. 
uh, we had to have a, a purple spin on this particular cocktail. So of course, with the Cosmopolitan, it is also going to go in a cocktail martini glass as well. We're going to start off by putting just a little bit of ice in our shaker cup. This one we're actually going to shake. It's going to help aerate and dilute the cocktail, but also help, like Ken said, make it a balance in the blended drink as well. So of course, potato vodka up again. Do an ounce and a half of that one. And then we're going to follow that up with just a half an ounce of our triple sec, which is an orange liqueur. Although I recommend Cointreau. Cointreau is a great one as well. Uh, Grand Gala is another one if you're not able to find yourself some Cointreau. And then, like Ken said, we are going to make it purple. So, of course, we're not going to use cranberry juice. We're actually going to substitute that with a little bit of grape juice on this one. And we're going to keep the ratio of the four amounts the same. So, we're going to use an ounce of grape juice rather than the cranberry. And then, the last ingredient that it calls for is lime juice. Ken said, earlier about it being not too sweet or not too sour. When you do work with actual limes, lime juice it is, if you get something that's heavily concentrated and not blended well, it can be a little bit overbearing and a little bit too sour for you. So I like the preference of actually taking just two fresh limes that we've cut up here today and just having the juice just squeeze right into the glass. And then we are gonna shake it a little bit, just enough for the cocktail mixer comes a little bit chilled on the outside that way you can tell that the cocktail on the inside give me a nice cold refreshing for you all right now that we got that done we are going to pour that right into our glass this is delicious by the way so good Thank you, James. Yeah, you're most welcome, Ken. Cheers. And then to finalize this, we are going to garnish it with a nice little lime wheel. And there we have our purple cosmopolitan. Go Eves. Well, before we go to the, to the last and remaining cocktail, and then a little bit of q and I just want to talk a little bit about my, my background in the industry, because I don't think I explained that earlier, but I am the co-founder of 44 North Vodka, which is based here in the state of Idaho. Uh, we're presently in the city of Boise, but our manufacturing facility is in Eastern Idaho, where all the potatoes are in a town called Shelley. And what we basically do there is take potatoes, distill them into vodka. We also do work with wheat because wheat is grown here. And actually there is a, a difference between a, a vodka made from wheat, one made from potato, and even one made, made from corn. Corn tends to be the most uh, voluminous vodka in the country. So products like Smirnoff, are, are made um, utilizing uh, uh, corn. And Kettle One, which is one of my go-tos if I'm not drinking mine, is made from wheat. There's Chopin from Poland, which is potato. That's another one of my go-tos. So the idea behind 44 North is to really showcase the agricultural bounty that's here. And one of the great things about a liberal arts education is how you can apply things from, from different places. So I mentioned a little bit of chemistry earlier, but one day many years ago, I was driving through a part of the state here called the Magic Valley, which several generations ago was just desert. And people figured out how to irrigate that land off of the Snake River. And the reason it's called the Magic Valley is because very quickly it went from being a barren, desolate place to one of the most productive agricultural regions in the United States. And just overnight, it's just this oasis in the middle of the desert, that particular area. And they grow a lot of different things there, corn, wheat, not as many potatoes, which are grown more in Eastern Idaho at higher elevations. But I had this epiphany about the, the farm and what it represents to all of us in this country and what farmers do. And, from, from the beginnings of civilization, right? 
the, the farmer was the person who enabled people to build the pyramids. So I often tell people, if there's no farm, there's no mission to Mars because the engineers have to eat and they don't have time to grow the food themselves. So essentially, you know, tying that all together, I had this epiphany and said, hey, this is, this is kind of a brand. This is a story to tell. And that's what we do at 44 North is, is talk about Idaho, the agricultural bounty, um, the landscape, the people. And I'd like to think we're, we're a little bit early in what people call the, the craft spirits uh, revolution, which you know basically is probably about maybe 10 years old or so. And distilleries are you know, popping up all over the country. But you know, I think we were one of the first to recognize that people were looking for local in their spirits as they were already looking for local in their wine and their beer. And those were the things that started as craft items first. And spirits as, as an industry tends to lag um, other innovative, more innovative categories. And I wouldn't say we're less innovative because we're lazy. Part of it is, is regula regulatory. Uh, wine and beer, obviously soft drinks have much fewer rules to, that they have to contend with. Uh, versus the spirits business, um, where we're not only responsible for uh, taxation, we also have to be responsible citizens and make sure that at least certainly here in Idaho, where the Idaho state constitution talks about temperance as an important value here. So uh, we have in our industry 50 states, we're sold in about 45 states, and every state has its own uh, set of rules and complexities that we have to contend with. And I think that may get in the way sometimes uh, of, of the innovation. But I digress and I'm gonna turn it over to James one more time, who's gonna talk to us about uh, our mocktail because some of you, because it's January, although this year you can, you don't have to do it this year, but I know in years past, some of you have gone dry in January. So we have to have something that's simple and easy for you folks. Ken Taylor shaking his head no. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started with today's mocktail. Gonna start off with a nice little shaker cup of ice. And for this one, we're just gonna make a simple raspberry vanilla lemon. So we're gonna start off with a raspberry type simple syrup. We're gonna put an ounce of that right into the shaker cup. And then we're gonna follow that up with some vanilla syrup. Then after we are gonna use our fresh lemon juice. And the great thing about a lemon juice is it's really easy to make any type of flavored lemonade type mocktail with any type of syrups or flavors that you might want. You can make it a little bit sweeter by putting another syrup in there, a simple syrup as well, just add sugar water. So we're gonna shake that all up to help blend the three ingredients really well. And we're gonna grab our fresh glass. And then pour this right on into that. And then we're just gonna follow it up and top it off with some soda water to help give it a little bit of carbonation, make it kind of more of that lemonade type feel. And then though we did shake it up, the carbonation in the soda water does like to sit on top of our mixture right there with all the syrups and the lemon juice. So I'm just gonna give it one final stir to help blend the mocktail up a little bit more. Like Ken said, it is January. A lot of people are taking some time off and drinking, but it is a crazy time we're living in, so don't feel bad if we don't. So there is our mocktail with the raspberry vanilla lemonade. James, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Ken. Everyone, thank you guys. A round of applause to James here. No, he can't hear you, but I think we have 142 people. Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, yeah, so, thank you for me. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome, Ken. Um, I'll open it up to uh, questions. 
in a second. Um, wow, someone I haven't heard from in a long time, Elizabeth Evans. Evans, good to see your name out here. Um, one of the funniest comments I saw was Trisha O'Reilly saying that uh, pop off is a Williams College tradition. For some reason, I don't understand. And I didn't understand it back then either, and I still don't, by the way. Um, but yeah, we, we did have pop off back then. But usually, we drank spirits at three occasions at that point. It was uh, homecoming, winter carnival, and spring weekend. That's really the only time we had cocktail bars. Usually, we're just standing around a keg uh, back then. Well, anyway, I just want to open it up to uh, any questions and just put them into the, it's cheap. Yes, and Melvin. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll try to do this as the questions come in. Oh, uh, someone just asked, do we make gin as well? And we do not at present, but we do have a new still that is going to be cranking out some whiskey for us soon. We, we acquired a local whiskey distiller last year and we disassembled everything, brought that equipment over to Eastern Idaho. We're putting it back together and that whiskey still will give us the capability to make gin products as well. Um, I see Tess McHugh 11, any chance to get 44 North at the spirit shop? I assume that's the spirit shop on Cole Avenue, right? Um, the last I was in Williamstown, there was some 44 North, I think it's West's Liquors now. It was King's back in the day when I bounced a check there. So, um, <laughs> um, true story, but Jerry was cool. He was cool. He was a good guy. Um, but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the story there. Try, try West on Spring Street. Wendy and Mike Coakley. Class of 85, who will the Jets draft in the first round? Oh man, I'm a Jets fan. So that's a real, real tough one. I'm hoping Sam Darnold is uh, okay. But first we have to pick a coach and let's let the coach decide who we draft. I think that's what we need to do with the Jets. Um, Sarah Griffith, sorry, no 44 North in Canada yet. We are definitely looking. Um, Ken Taylor, 44 North in Atlanta, it is there. I will send you a list of accounts. I can go online and, and pull up some places for you. Um, who else here? Oh, Trisha O'Reilly, 07, favorite Williams memory. Well, this is a bittersweet one for me. Um, it was 1982, it was March, and I went to the Williams E um 60s party at spencer house and that's where i met emmy olmstead who i married in 1988 and uh sadly lost her last year but um when i think about my my williams days uh certainly you know there are a lot of fond memories but that's one that just pops up um yeah that was a good night um Who else here? Recipe. Todd Pelkey, who emailed us. He says, I found 44 North Vodka in Southern California. It's awesome. Thanks, Todd. We really appreciate it. Uh, high time in Costa Mesa is a great customer. Oh, Megan Steele says, where did I get my hat? Good question. Um, I have to check with my daughter, but she gave this hat to me. It's a play on the Patagonia logo. And I, I think it's probably class of 18 swag, but I'll, I'll check in with her and um, confirm that. But I think that's that's what it is, but she, she gave it to me. Um, Audrey Sheffield, 84, thank you. I miss Emmy too. Um, Liz Emmons, sorry, you didn't know. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was tough, but um, great memories. My, my favorite cocktail at Williams asks Philip Chin. Oh man, that's a, that's a real good one. Um, because at that point it was probably at a place called Rogers Roost 50 cent vodka night. Uh, and it probably had pop off in it. So I would say my favorite cocktail was anything that cost 50 cents. Okay, Mo McDonald 86 wants to know about the bottle design. 
Um, it's not behind me at the moment. But when we, when we created the product, there are two ways to, to do liquor bottles, right? So you can, you can get a custom bottle or you can buy what's known as a stock bottle. So we started out actually with that bottle, but it was at the time a, a stock bottle made in Italy. And then once we had the name and we got the designers involved, we ended up obviously with the logo and, and design, but the bottle itself is an Italian bottle and you'll find it in a lot of limoncellos. But what we did uh, a few years ago is we actually were able to move our glass production to the United States. And we're now making our bottles in Missouri and the bottles actually are now are custom. It's the same shape, but there is a little bit of an Easter egg underneath the bottle on the bottom. And it's basically the, uh, the map of Idaho, which you know kind of portrays the, uh, the heritage of the brand. So just because I am um, a little bit of a knucklehead, I got to name the bottle at the glass factory. So they said, well, what do you wanna call this bottle, Ken? And I said, let's call it the America First Bottle. So that's what it's known as. But totally, total um, sarcasm on my part. So, but anyway, I got to name it. Um, Wynn says a Madras at Winter Carnival was his favorite cocktail. And that, yeah, that was a popular one at the time. Um, okay, I think Liz Robinson wants to ask a live question. I think we have to unmute Liz, but I don't have that power. Sorry, if I pushed the hand up button, that was a total mistake. I'm sorry, but this is awesome. And thank you very much for doing it. Sorry. What class? 1990. Go Eves. This is wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. I feel like I'm back in college and I miss it terribly. And anything, I, anything for Williams. Thanks. Okay. Who, Tom Davies, best cocktail at Williams, can of lemonade, concentrate from Joe King and Baxter and a bottle of Jack. I don't want to know any more about that. Um, Renee Robinson, yes, our vodkas are gluten-free. And actually there's been a recent change uh, in the rulings with regards to that. So I'll give you a little bit of history. So a few years ago, um, the only spirits you could say were gluten-free were spirits that were made from a, a grain or a feedstock, as we say in the industry, that doesn't contain gluten. So potatoes, certainly for sure. Um, wheat, obviously a no-no, right? Barley, a no-no. And that was the rule for years, mainly because the government was hesitant um, as they hadn't come up with a way to test for gluten in spirits. And they really haven't come up with an idea to test for gluten in spirits, but they changed the rule. So the rule is, is that anything that is distilled is now technically gluten-free, as long as you don't add anything back to it that contains gluten. And in the case of 44 North, all of our ingredients are gluten-free and certified as such. So we're actually able to put it on the bottle. The, um, the government requires every beer, wine, and spirit to submit their label to the Tax and Trade Bureau of the Treasury Department in Washington. So they review our label and they review our claims and any claims that are on the label, they check what we call our formulation to ensure that we're in compliance. So we're actually able on all of our 44 North products to have a little uh, uh, gluten-free symbol circle on the bottle. And that's something that um, you know we're, we're very proud of, but technically all spirits are gluten-free unless they add something later that contains gluten. So that's kind of the new rule, just fresh rules. When are you planning to make a spirit about Williams? Says Tyler Holden 13. That's a, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I need to think about that idea. I probably wouldn't do it in Idaho. I'd probably go talk to the guys at Greylock Spirits in uh, Berkshire County. They've got a cool little local business there. Um, they're, actually some pretty cool local distillers in mass. 
So yeah, maybe that's a project uh, down the road. Um, certainly something to take a look at. Ephraim Williams, yep, that'd be a cool name. Okay, Susan Reifer, best places you recommend to drink great 44 North cocktails post pandemic in Idaho? Well, Amsterdam Lounge is, is a great spot. So certainly there, but if I have to pick one particular place, I would pick the Roundhouse at Sun Valley, which is, uh, you can get there via gondola and on the, on the ski hill, it's open for dinner most of the time. The fondue is fantastic, but they do serve 44 North. And that's just one of my favorite places probably to have a 44 North cocktail. Okay. My daughter, Caroline, she is on. She sent me a direct message. She says, dad, quiet, get off the screen. No, just kidding. She says, uh, tell them about the huckleberry cream. We, um, at last year in, well, late October released a new product. It's a huckleberry cream liqueur. And it's, I guess you can imagine Bailey's cream liqueur, which is, well, there's a debate about how much Irish cream is in Bailey's, but anyway, it's a, a kind of a whiskey flavored liqueur, let's say, right? And what we've done is basically taken our, our huckleberry uh, infusion and have added it to a cream product. So that just launched. And if you take a look at our social media, you can take a peek at it. It's available probably in about 10 different states right now. California soon, Idaho, Montana at present, Nevada soon, Washington State and Oregon soon, Massachusetts now, New York now, Florida, um, I think soon as well. So it's, it's getting out there, but um, that is, that is our, our newest uh, product. And who else? No, Mr. Troyer, no Everclear and Fruit Punch, please. <laughs> uh, Ken, yes, 44 North in Colorado and the cream is there as well. Trisha O'Reilly asked another question. Do people in Idaho know about Williams or do you get blank stares? Well, honestly, when I first got here, I'd see people with W's on their uh, hats or on sweatshirts. And I'd go up to them and say, hey, Williams. They'd go, no, you dub. Um, I will say this. I do have a few Williams peeps in town, a few Bowdoin peeps here in town. So NESCAC is, is definitely representing here. And when I wear my Williams stuff at the gym, I, I get the occasional, you know, that's really a great school. But it's, it's certainly not as well known as uh, some others other places. For example, um, you know, I, I get to wear a Stanford shirt for a few years. So the, uh, that gets more, more comments than the William stuff. Uh, Wendy and Mike want to know about the packaging for the new product. I'm assuming they're meaning the Huckleberry cream. And one of the cool things about that product is that the bottle is painted a, a very, very deep purple, right? And when we designed the package, I told the designers that I wanted a purple cow on the case box. And some people on my team said, what's with this purple cow? I don't like it. And I said, the cow is non-negotiable. <laughs> I said, the cow stays on the box. And uh, I've gotten a lot of positive comments about the cow. So thanks for asking Wendy and, and Mike. Okay. Um, That's right, Val, the cow is non-negotiable. <laughs> oh, how does a Williams, being a Williams parent affect your perspective as an alum? That's a great question. You know, I'm a pretty headstrong guy, right? So it, it's difficult to, to guide me to in any direction, I'm just, I kind of have my direction and I'm going to set out on it, but there, there's one person who's very, very good about 
letting me know that I, I may not be doing things the right way. And that's my daughter, Caroline. So when she was at Williams at the beginning, I, I would spend time reminiscing about my days at Williams. And, you know, rightfully so, it got on her nerves. And I realized that if, if anything, Williams has changed a lot in, you know, in, in many, many respects. Certainly from diversity, I think when, when I was there in 84, we probably had 5% of the class African-American. And that's just a number that obviously uh, sticks out for me being African-American, but I think the number now is closer to 13%. And you know, when you look at the statistics, you just see a much more diverse Williams, not just in terms of uh, racial diversity, but economic diversity and uh, geographic diversity internationally. The, the college is, is certainly more diverse. And those are all, I think, wonderful, great things. Um, if I have may maybe one complaint, I, I kind of like walking in the dirt paths that we had and all the mud, and now everything is nicely manicured. So my, my rustic country college is, you know, has changed. So I can complain about that, but I don't want to be one of those people who says, well, back in my day, it was so great because I think Williams is still great. And what, what makes it great, I think, is that regardless of the era, and I've been lucky to, to know people from several generations of the college because my late wife, her dad was class of 52. I think her dad, her grandfather was 20. Four or 27. I don't know why I get those mixed up. But anyway, I, I, I got to know generations of Williams people. And I think the ethos, regardless um, of the period, is still the same. Um, you know, the Mark Hopkins and that log experience is still what Williams is all about. And it's about being in the middle of this place, quite frankly, that, you know, maybe the Amherst people had a point when they left and, and, and fled to a, a more populated area. But here you are stuck for four years in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of folks. And you have to figure out how to build a community and build relationships. And I just think that that's an incredibly powerful experience that hasn't really changed. And I, I recommend um, anyone here who hasn't to pick up the Fred Rudolph books on the history of Williams and, and read those. Class of 47, I believe he was, and taught at Williams. And, you know, it's kind of, I guess you'd say he's the Williams historian, although uh, I'm a Mike Beschlaus fan these days. Um, I like what he's rapping about. Um, so I, I think if you look at what Williams stands for, I, I, I don't think it's changed as much as, you know, some people might complain about. And can the college be better? Always, but I found in my years, um, it's, it's certainly one of my most proud affiliations. And um, it's, uh, I get choked up about it. It's, a, it's such a great place, wonderful people. And um, it's a different school than it was when I was there. And that's, I think that's all good because if you don't change, um, you die and I'm gonna just shut up about this. But if you read the Fred Rudolph history, he'll talk about the phases of the college, the different historical phases. So from um, kind of Christian college, you know, it's basically to prepare boys from Berkshire County for the congregational ministry to a gentleman's college, to what Fred Rudolph, I'm trying to think of his exact term, but you know, kind of more of the popular college that we see today in terms of just more representation of different parts of society and how the college more. And the key to that is like, like I said, the college has maintained the basics of its ethos. And one of the greatest things, and this is something Beschlaus has talked about, Michael Beschlaus, the historian, the US presidential historian, but he's talked about the leadership of Williams. He's written articles about that. And we've been blessed, I think, with some incredible leaders over the years. I can go through the history and cite some that I don't like as much um, because you did have some, some presidents who were um, had more restrictive thoughts about what, who a Williams education was for, but certainly Chandler, who was my president and his predecessor Sawyer, I think are two of the greatest uh, leaders in American higher education. 
Um, and just, you know, I, 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 I just think that what they did was amazing in terms of how they transformed the college um, from gentlemen's college to what it is today. So I'll shut up on that. Okay, any more questions? Yep, well, we're getting to the end here. So I've been on this thing almost an hour and I just wanna thank all of you for joining tonight to share a cocktail, some uh, ETH camaraderie, and I'm hoping to see many of you on, well, I almost said Weston Field, but Farley Lamb Field, one of those changes <laughs> at Williams, but hope to see you guys there in the fall. So uh, go Eves, stay safe everyone.